very rarefied. It's not like, you know. Um, so I'm praying to John Paul II, Fulton Sheen, and uh, and uh, Monsignor Baker. Right? These are three people that are that are you know up for canonization. Right? Pray for all three of them and to heal my big toe because I smashed my big toe. And then my big toe is healed. Well, who do I attribute that to? Was it through the intercession of Yonkel II? Was it through the intercession of Monsignor Baker? Was it through the intercession of Paul Machine? We have no idea. So the cause of the saints, when they're kind of determining who is in heaven and who isn't, when, when the cause is mine, they say, we can't accept that as a miracle. Because we don't know. So if you, if you had only prayed exclusively, you and everybody else that was praying for this person to be healed from cancer, and they were miraculously healed from cancer, and there's even rules on what is considered um, and borderline cases are assumed not to be, um, is that everybody involved in that was praying for one person, to one person. And if, it, if it wasn't that specific, then they can't accept it. It's a very verified process um, when it comes down to the miracles. The so, yeah, so that's the only way we can know. That's why we can't know if anyone is in hell. There's no way to know if someone's in hell. Because people in hell don't affect this world. But people in heaven and people in purgatory can affect this world. Well, does, it, does Satan affect the world? He does, but he's been given that dominion. He's in hell. He's in hell. Uh, he is in his end, right? Because he's been given that dominion. That's different. So hell for us is a permanent state. Hell for the demons is also a permanent state, but they've been given dominion over this world. God has given them that. Um, one of the best examples of that is Job. You know, when Satan, when Satan goes before God and has his little wager, or when Satan is tempting Jesus in the desert, or when the demons are, are possessing the demoniacs, or whatever. They have that role in God's plan of salvation. Why? I don't know, but that's the way God set it up. So, my point is, what is important to take out of this is that we have no idea who is elected and who isn't elected. And we have no idea how this all works. But we know a couple things. We know that you can't get to heaven unless you've been elected by God. We know that you can't do anything to become part of the elect. When it comes to election, these are the two things that we know. But we also know that God says that he desires that everyone is saved. But we don't know how that works together. There's nothing that we know for sure that we can say is an absolute statement how those two things work together. Justified freely by His grace. That's important. So, uh, freely by His grace in some ways is redundant. Because if you take grace to be gift, you already assume grace to be gift. Um, but it's His gift to give us. There are two fundamental views about justification. There's the, there's the view of, of Martin Luther, and, and for the most part, Martin Luther's hard to follow. If you actually ever read anything that Martin Luther wrote, he doesn't
doesn't have a consistent theology. Um, it's very scattered. Um, and uh, that's why Calvin comes along. Calvin comes along to try and bring back some kind of consistency to, to Protestant thought. Um, and Thomas Watts. Uh, and you can actually say that the, the, the argument between these two figures of history actually goes back to an argument between Thomas Aquinas uh, and the Dominicans and um, the Franciscans uh, with remember at the beginning how I mentioned that there's a difference between something being done to you on the outside in a superficial kind of way and something being done to you from the inside that's the fundamental difference I'm sure we've all heard the stories of you know, Martin Luther's uh, snow-covered donkey, that we're, we're snow-covered donkeys. Or another way of another way of looking at it is is that um, is that uh, uh, at, at the judgment, at our particular judgment, uh, you're standing before God the Judge, God, you know, to, and He's ready to condemn you because you're worthy of condemnation, which is true, and and you're worthy of condemnation, so God is going to condemn you. But right before he condemns you, he mistakes you for Jesus. And you go, oh, wait. So, and, and, then, and then you're okay. That's kind of the way, that's kind of the way the notion of justification in the, the cross line works. It's a legal act. You're justified through a legal action of God. He just makes you justified by, by pointing and saying you are justified. So you can't become a saint. Yeah, you can. I mean, the, 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 it's just you. You the, the notion of what is a saint is different. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So now the more Catholic position, the, the position that Aquinas holds, uh, and and that the Church picked up, because you, you have to understand the reason why I, I quote Aquinas is that uh, oftentimes, like if you look at the Council of Trent, which where most of the dogmas of the church have been defined, the majority of all dogmas were defined at Trent, um, they pretty much lifted just pages off of the Summa. They just lifted what Aquinas said and made it canonical. Uh, it, so, so when the church thinks about theology, it thinks of Aquinas. Uh, there's other theologians that have done and contributed a lot of good things, but, but he's kind of the, the heart of it all. And then everybody kind of revolves around. Uh, granted, that's a biased Dominican way of looking at it, but, mm -hmm. but I think I can prove that case. Um, what Aquinas does, though, is Aquinas has a very different view. He has a very different view. He says, we, we are changed. We are made into something different. We're not justified. We're not, we don't, the process of justification is not covering you with a veneer. So we are used to hearing the term sanctifying grace. Right? You hear that a lot, sanctifying grace. Um, what Aquinas uses in that place, in the place of the term sanctifying grace, he uses he uses justification. So it is the the, the grace that justifies, or Another way to put it, it's the grace that makes you pleasing to God. So, the first thing that we must realize is that without sanctifying grace, we are not pleasing to God. That's important. And it's hard to hear. Because we all think we're good people. But, we don't deserve So we are not pleasing, <coughs> we are not pleasing to God until He makes us pleasing to Him. And He does that through sanctifying grace. That's what sanctifying grace is. 